Good evening, and welcome to Calvary Assembly of God on this Pentecost Sunday. We've gathered this evening to celebrate, to remember, and yes, to be touched again by the meaning of Pentecost, by the meaning and yet the little experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit within us. We're so thankful that Jesus didn't just go and say, get the job done, but he said, here I am, I give myself to you through my spirit. Now get the job done, and we can. And so during this missions emphasis time, we are thankful to be able to say, yes, it is by the spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so it is his spirit that we are so excited, so excited to talk about during missions month, during today, as we celebrate the, the Sunday of Pentecost. So welcome to this day of Pentecost. Tonight, we're going to divide our time into, into actually kind of four sessions. Session number one will be the reading of the scripture and then hearing from our uh, executives, our head pastors for the entire Assemblies of God as they explain to us what the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is to us. Then the second session, we're going to talk about how individuals who have been greatly used of God originally were filled with the Holy Spirit. I know that part's going to bless you. Third, we're going to talk about how once the Holy Spirit was within them, how they were able to minister great things, and great things happened because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, I'm just going to pray with you for a few moments and then release you to go and spend some time on your own knees praying for the filling and the refilling of the Holy Spirit. So if you would, I'd like to start with just opening in prayer, and then I'd like to ask God to just talk to us through the Word of God. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I do pray at this moment that, Lord, you help us tonight to see how important, how much you want the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon each believer at Calvary Assembly. I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would open their hearts. They would open, Lord, just their whole self to say, Lord, use me. I yield to you. Now fill me. Lord, bless, we pray. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, may your power be upon each one. We pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Well, just before we introduce our head pastors, I would really like to read the scriptures to you of where we're basing everything on tonight. We're going to go to Acts, the first chapter. In Acts, the first chapter, I'm verses 4, 5, and 6, and then I'll read 7 and 8, then I'll jump over to Acts 2. It says, they were assembled together. So Jesus was with the disciples. He's risen from the dead. And he says this, Jesus commands them, do not start telling people about the, bit, about the resurrection yet. Instead, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. Do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what? There is something called the promise of the Father. The promise which Jesus said, you have heard, I've already talked to you about from me. For John, truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now we go down to verse 7. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own authority, but... Now that's an interesting thing. Verse, verse 6, they ask a question. Verse 7, Jesus said, That's a good question, but I've got a better answer you should be asking this question. And here's a better answer to the better question. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what did he say? He said, stay here, do not depart, wait for the promise of the Father, that which he will give to you. And at least in reading your Bible, you didn't have to wait very long because as chapter 1 finishes, chapter 2 starts, and here's what it says, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together, they were in one accord in one place, and suddenly, let's believe tonight for suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. Verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit 
gave them utterance. And then if we jump down a little later, it's finally now we kind of get clarification on what's going on and who this, this gift, who this baptism is for. We go down to verses 37, 38, and 39. Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What should our response be to the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And he said, then Jesus said to them, well, first thing is you got to get right with God. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And then your next step is you shall receive, that's where we are tonight, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift of the Holy Spirit, whether it's salvation or the gift of the Holy Spirit, this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. That includes you and me. We're going to do right now a short video of the top pastors of the Assemblies of God, and it's called AG Today, Assemblies of God Today. Uh, they put it out just in the past few days, and so we're able to share this with you in, in helping us understand Pentecost. And I do believe you're going to enjoy this. The four, four pastors are going to talk to us are Choco de Jesus, Rick DeBose, Doug Clay, and Donna Barrett. They'll share how the Holy Spirit ministers. I really like what Rick says. In fact, they do the opening of this, this uh, clip helps you understand that you can speak with tongues, but are, are you being used of the Holy Spirit? Oh, man, we can say, God, fill me, and then almost shut down the process. Not only be filled, be used of God. And so if you would, please, let's transition right over there now, and let's watch this time of video with them. Sometimes I'm concerned that the Holy Spirit is not able to bring those gifts. If you look at those words that are used, those gifts can also be called qualifiers. You're not really this good, but I'm going to give you something that qualifies you and makes you better. And if we don't give Him room to bring His gifts, we may still speak in tongues, but we're not walking in the fullness of what's available. Pentecost, it's a Christian holiday observed on the seventh Sunday after Easter that celebrates the receiving of the Holy Spirit by the early church. The day of Pentecost is known in the Christian church as the day on which the Spirit descended upon the disciples and the apostles under Peter's preaching and thousands were converted in Jerusalem. You know, if you go back and read the Old Testament, you'll discover that Pentecost was one of the Jewish feast days. Only they didn't call it Pentecost. That's the Greek name. The Jews called it the Feast of Harvest. It was the celebration of the beginning of the early weeks of harvest. In the New Testament, John the Baptist prophesied of the first Pentecost when Jesus would baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus confirmed this prophecy with the promise of the Holy Spirit to the disciples when he said, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. He then went and showed himself to these men after his death on the cross and his resurrection, giving convincing proof that he was alive. So Jesus told his disciples, now go wait in Jerusalem for the Father's gift of the Holy Spirit for whom they would receive power to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And then after Jesus' ascension to heaven, the men returned to Jerusalem, joined together in a prayer in the upper room, and on the day of Pentecost, the sound of a rushing mighty wind filled the house, tongues of fire came and rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. The power had come upon them just as it had been promised. Peter then emerges on the day of Pentecost as a Pentecostal believer and right away began to minister under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, a ministry which Jesus had prepared him for. After the coming upon the Holy Spirit, the disciples, you know what? They didn't stay in that room just basking in God's glory, but they went out to change the world and they began to proclaim the gospel. This was the beginning of the church as we know it today. So 
Today, in many Christian churches, Pentecost is celebrated to recognize the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Today, we want to celebrate it, and I'm joined by the executive leadership team just to talk about Pentecost. And so I would ask this team, what's Pentecost mean to you? It's, it's, it's such a dear, it's a dear value to who we are as Assemblies of God leaders, but in a personal way. What, Donna, what's Pentecost mean to you? Yeah, you know, when I interact with people right now about Pentecost, the topic I find us talking about the most is the discipline of praying in the Spirit and being intentional about that. I started a habit recently of actually setting the timer on my cell phone and being intentional to pray in the Spirit for a set amount of time because I can't um, think of a time when we have needed the wisdom of the Holy Spirit more than we do right now. We don't have the details we know to pray in English. So to be able to pray in the Spirit, it's, it's not just, you know, praying in the Spirit is not just an experience that happens one time at youth camp or at right. the end of a, a prayer time at the altar, but it's a discipline we should practice regularly. And I'm so thankful for the privilege we have of praying in the Spirit as a daily discipline. Amen. Amen. I, like Amen. Amen. That's awesome. I, I like what she said, it's a privilege. You know, sometimes there's this feeling like, well, I have to, or it's an obligation, or it's like a, a moonroof in a car, it's, it's optional, but it's a privilege. It's a privilege for followers of Jesus to experience the coming upon the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. Choco, what's the Holy Spirit, what's Pentecost mean to you? Yeah, so when I, when I think about Pentecost, I think about uh, being grateful that Jesus left that he had to leave. He yeah. even says it. I, I, I got I to gotta go so that the paraclete can come. Yeah. The Holy Spirit in John speaks about that. So when I think about Pentecost, I think about him leaving, but sending us help to get through what we're going to get through, help. pastoring, uh, marriage, and so forth. And then the Holy Spirit, the person, it's not a thing, the person of the Holy Spirit. So when I think about Pentecost, sometimes back when, when I was pastoring in Chicago, I would, you know, we would put a lot of emphasis on Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. Mm -hmm. But somehow Pentecost Sunday would be left off. But in our church, we did a series leading towards the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was a great experience back I back think it's a, it can be a game changer for people. It I is. Mean, when you think of the benefits That's of right. the infilling of the Holy Spirit, why wouldn't we want the people we lead to have all that the Lord has promised them? That's good. Incredible. You know, when... Uh, when the revival or the, the evangelism left Jerusalem and made its way into Samaria, as soon as they heard that the Samaritans believed, they sent word back to the apostles who were still in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And as soon as Peter got there, he asked that question. Have any received the Holy Spirit since they believed? Philip's response was, no, they've, they only have received Jesus and been baptized in water. He said, well, then get out of the way. And he started telling them about the power of the Holy Spirit because he knew how important it was. And sometimes it's, my, it's a concern that we get them saved, but we don't understand the same way Peter did. If you've experienced what I've experienced, if you understand Jesus got out of the way so he could come, you know this, it, this matters. We've got to move you into it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's so good. What do you think we can do to bring encouragement to our churches on, on just talking about Pentecost, talking about the work of the Spirit, talking about the, the person of the Holy Spirit? One of the things, uh, Pastor, I think about, you said it earlier, the, the, the commission, the great commission, mm -hmm. the churches and the pastors need to understand that is, out of Matthew chapter 28, it's not the great suggestion, it's the great commission. Sure. And in order to fulfill that great commission, we need to know, understand the role of the Holy Spirit. And so one of the things we can encourage pastors to do is to highlight it in their calendar, yeah. uh, be able to do sermon series around it, Bible studies on Wednesdays regarding the person of the Holy Spirit. Because sure. usually we kind of leave out the third person right. uh, of the Trinity. The stat that I was referring to just recently has come out and said that 51% of evangelicals wow. had no concept of what the Great Commission. Hmm. Oh, wow. And so, I, yes. boy, I don't want to lose that soul-winning passion yes. within the That's assemblies. Right. That's right. 
I think normalizing Pentecost in the church and not letting it just be a holiday on Pentecost Sunday, but just normalizing it in every part of the life of the church would help people appreciate Pentecost and use it and realize that Pentecost was given so that we could have boldness to be witnesses mm -hmm. and fulfill the Great Commission. The two work hand in hand right. and we can't separate it and make a holiday yeah. out of Pentecost. Yeah, so good. It's really good. And I like what you said a while ago, having the Holy Spirit as my prayer partner. Because according to Scripture, He's already searched out the very mind of God, knows the will of God, the timing of God, the ways of God. He's got it all. And I don't have any other prayer partner that can do that. And so when He begins to guide me in my prayer, first in tongues, but also even in, in an understandable language, right. that I partner with Him for prayer, it becomes so powerful. If you're not walking in the fullness of, of the anointing of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you never get to that level of prayer partnership. So I love that. I love what you said. I like it being tied as you did back to the day it came. And the day it came yeah. was a day that was all about harvest. And there's a reason why it was on that day. Here's my concern. My concern is that we have the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, the thing that supernaturally enables us because He came. But there is also the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and I, I, sometimes I'm concerned that the Holy Spirit is not able to bring those gifts. If you, if you look at those words that are used, you know, in the mm -hmm. original language, it's a, it's a, those gifts can also be called qualifiers. They're literally a free qualifier. You're not really this good, but I'm going to give you something that qualifies you and makes you better. You're only at this level, but what I'm giving you puts you at this level. And something happens in the church when the gifts of the Spirit begin to flow. And when the Holy Spirit says, hey, let me, do, let me work through you in these gifts. So the prophetic voice, uh, the, the, work, the word of knowledge, yeah. you know, all, all the things that He brings, as well as healing. As, that's one of His gifts, the, these incredible miracles. And if we don't give Him room to bring His gifts, we may still speak in tongues, but we're not walking mm -hmm. in the fullness of what's available. And to make room for that. And, and it's, we, have, we have so many people that have come to know the Lord in our churches that often they're having to back church services up to each other and they're trying to move in hurry. And so then they say, well, but we're going to make room for the gifts of the Spirit in our small groups. And, and maybe, maybe that's exactly what's happening. All I want to say to a pastor is make sure. sure. Make that's sure so there's good. an incredible opportunity for him to bring those qualifiers because we're not that good, but he is. <laughs> and if we give him that chance, that's part of the reason of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Let's don't leave that off the table. That's, that's so good, Rick. And I think with the gifts of the Spirit, to understand that it's not just for 1030 on Sunday morning that the gifts of the Spirit operate, but they are gifts for the marketplace all throughout the week. All throughout the Bible. And yeah, throughout the Bible, it's the gifts for the marketplace. So I'm glad that you brought that up. That's very good. You mentioned power, just to add to what you guys are saying. Sometimes we think it's just power of the gifts of the Spirit, but also the Holy Spirit gives you power to give, Yep. and power to forgive, oh, which true. sometimes we don't, we don't think that's, we need that power. But in order to operate in the Spirit, we need to know that's part of it as well. Right. Not only seeking the dunamis, yeah. right? speaking in tongues, which is important, but also to forgive people. Yeah. We need that power. Right. That's good. Yeah. I love talking about my favorite person in the Bible, and that's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. When I think of Pentecost, and we're... In just a moment, Rick is going to pray for Pentecost Sunday for you and your church. You know, so when I think of Pentecost, I think of harvest, power, and unity. Harvest, the bringing people to Jesus. Power, the ability to do what Jesus did, right. even in a greater dimension. I can't comprehend that. Yet Jesus said it. That's You'll yep. do greater things. And then unity uniting around the purpose to expand God's kingdom here on earth. You know, when Jesus walked on earth, he did many miracles wherever he went, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, and more. However, when Jesus was about to leave the earth, God had a plan. Oh, he said, all this that I've spoken and done with you, you're not going to be alone. I'm going to send you an advocate yes. and the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. This is in John. And he'll teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I've told you. That's good. So God knew that when Jesus would go to heaven, 
Um, the Christians would need more than just the written word to spread the gospel uh, to win souls for the kingdom. They would need that empowerment that yes. we've been talking about. Yes. They would need access to the same power that Jesus used when he was doing miracles and when he was expanding the kingdom here on earth. Mm. So, yeah, Pentecost, it's a big deal. And finally, the unity of the Spirit. Paul said, make every effort to keep the unity of the right. Spirit through the bond of peace. Right. You know, I take that to mean that the Holy Spirit is the source That's of right. unity. Come He's on. the giver of unity. So as Spirit-filled leaders, as Spirit-filled Christians, yeah. we should be the most unified yes. Yes. church. Yes. Yes. Unity leading culture back. Yes. So. Hey, Pastor A Church leader, you know, our commitment is this, our feelings are this, Pentecost is not just a day to be celebrated or a theological concept to be debated. Yeah. It's a spiritual reality to be experienced. We've experienced Pentecost yes. and yes. we desire our churches and our leaders Amen. to experience Pentecost. Rick, would you pray? Would you pray for our churches that on Pentecost Sunday, there would be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit? I'll do it. Father, I thank you that you chose to send your own spirit, the same spirit that's in Christ, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that is before and out of your throne, the one spirit we participate in him. Holy Spirit, you have been sent that you may bring conviction on the world of its sin and that you may convince them of your deity and you may empower us to live it out before them. I pray that that anointing, that work, that baptism would come to us. I pray a fresh release from heaven onto the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. A fresh release. Just open the windows of heaven as it's been prayed before. As your own word declares, Declares, open the windows, yes. open anything that hinders the flow of the yes. Holy Spirit and let him pour out upon our churches on Pentecost Sunday. I pray that something would happen, that sin would be convicted. There would be a sense of need for righteousness that would begin to permeate our thoughts and our families, our people and those attending. And the reality that you are Lord would become so real and so rich and that the power to fulfill your call would become so evident that it would really be a day that marks a change yes. in America. Yes. There would be a divine change in the American church that this Pentecost would in some ways be remembered as the original Pentecost was for the fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We ask this, oh God, because there's no prayer too big to ask because you're so big you can answer it. We ask for this in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it. Amen. 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 I, I'm thankful for how they clarify and how they give understanding to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful to be part of a movement that has such godly leaders, men and women, who say, we want, we want to be filled ourselves, and we want all that we can influence to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this next segment is going to have several of, of other pastors from around the nation who are going to talk about how they were filled with the Holy Spirit initially. Now most of them are, are beyond middle age at this point, but they're going to go back to the time that they were, maybe like some of our young people watching here this evening, ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And some of the, some of the obstacles they hit, uh, you know, every one of us have something in the back of our mind of, that holds us back, that slows us down. Uh, whether you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit or not, you can, you can say, I know what, what they're exactly talking about. And some, I like what Rod Loyal talk about when he talks about how uh, he was more of introvert. And even being introverted, he wasn't ready just to, kind of come up in front of everybody and, and he wanted to do it in a very quiet way. And God can honor and will honor that in you. God created you one way. He will honor it and, and work with you because he wants his goal, obviously, is to fill you with the Holy Spirit. So let's listen to these five, six, seven testimonies of how these men and women were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's go to that now. 
Hey, this is Pastor Choco. My experience of the Holy Spirit came when I was around 14 years old. I just received Jesus Christ. And I was not always born in the Christian church. I was raised in Catholicism. And so when I got saved and going to a church on a Sunday night, and I began to see people jumping and screaming and speaking another language, and I know it wasn't Spanish because I'm Hispanic, that what I saw began to uh, maybe cause some fear that I created some wars that uh, I, I thought this can be real, this cannot be God. Until the curiosity of me and said, wait a minute, what if this is, this is the Lord? And I remember that um, going to the altar myself, curious about this experience that people were having, that I too wanted this. And, and the Holy Spirit is about being filled in the Holy Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit. And, um, and I remember going to the altar and I was there for at least an hour and a half to two hours praying and crying. And, and it was there that I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. And that, real, that marked me for the rest of my life. That marked me, that experience is what catapulted me going forward being filled with the Holy Ghost, giving me boldness, giving me the words and the strength to talk in, a, in my city. And so for me, that would be my experience uh, of the Holy Spirit. I was 11 years and 11 months old. I was too young to be at a youth camp, but my mother intervened by asking the decap back then, decap, uh, would you please allow my youngest to come so he could be at camp with his two older brothers? and thankfully they allowed me. On a Thursday night, I was praying in the altar seeking God and uh, just short of 12 years old, was wonderfully baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues as the Spirit uh, gave me the ability. And in the midst of that, Jesus came to me. Uh, his voice spoke into my heart and asked if I would preach his gospel. And I said, yes, Lord, I would, I would do anything you ask. Nobody knew who I was. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what my future was. But I'm so thankful for the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit knew that I would fulfill a call to ministry leadership, that I would have the privilege of leading camps myself someday and seeing many boys and girls and students come to the fullness of the baptism of the Spirit and to have the privilege of being a district youth director, now a superintendent for the Assemblies of God just having a place of influence and opportunity. But it all started because the Spirit of God flooded me and I was baptized with the Spirit and power. I am thankful for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and His empowerment. When I was 19 years old, I was serving time in a penal institution in California. I gave my life to Jesus, but I soon realized this was a life I could not live. Uh, I, there was something that was missing in my life. I wasn't raised Pentecostal, though I went to church as a kid. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. And a gentleman approached me one day and asked me, had I been filled with the Holy Spirit? And I looked at him and said, what is that? And he said, I know about the Holy Spirit and I'm not a Christian and you don't know about the Holy Spirit and you're trying to live for God. And he literally got convicted and gave his life to Christ. And I followed him and I noticed something about him. He had a boldness that I did not have. Tony would talk to anybody. He would witness to any, I mean, some of the people that we were there for, uh, nobody was there for missing Sunday school. And so his boldness really challenged me. And I, and I went, I begged, I pleaded, I did everything I could asking God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And one day I was alone in a woodshed and I began to say, God, I need whatever you have to offer. And it was a Pentecostal preacher that told us that we worship God, He will fill us. He told us the scripture where it says, they that hunger and thirst after their righteousness shall be satisfied. I lifted my hands, I began to worship Jesus, and it was like all of heaven was opened up and He was trying to push it inside of me. And I began to pray in tongues and dance around this room, and a hunger developed inside of me whereby God has allowed me to never look back. I'm as hungry today as I was when I was 19 years old for more of Jesus and what he has to offer. From the time I was eight, nine, 10, 11 years of age, I was going to church camp in our district. 
Uh, the annual youth camp was a big deal. But I was quiet and reserved, and there were always services where people were praying to receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was so analytical, so I had two things that I was trying to work through. I loved God. I wanted all He had for me, but I was incredibly reserved and quiet, and I was always trying to figure everything out intellectually. So I would go into those prayer rooms, and it was loud. In those days, there were many people praying, and often if you responded for prayer for the Holy Spirit, I was hungry for all God had for me. But I would have someone on my right praying over me and saying, Honey, let go, let go. And on the other side of me, I'd have some woman praying sincerely, Hang on, honey, hang on. I was so, I, I was so quiet that all the noise for me was distraction. It wasn't until one night everybody left and it all was quiet. And there, just Beth, and God. I was in His presence, and I began to pray and say, God, I want all you have for me. And as I was in His presence, that sense of His presence grew, and suddenly as I worshiped and began to praise Him with an open heart, He filled me with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I love that because He knew who I was. He knew I needed the quiet place and the power of the Spirit. He does not always have to come in the loud and what is overwhelming. Often He's come to me all these years. Ever since He filled me with the Spirit, and as He daily fills me, it's in the quiet place. He knows who we are. He knows what we need. And He knew I would need the power of the Spirit and the courage of the Holy Spirit to do what He's called me to do. I'm dependent on Him. I was one of those people that was waiting and waiting, waiting at the altar uh, so that I could get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I remember when I heard this, I was uh, uh, 11 years old, and I remember I looked around at all my friends and I was like, do you guys want this? And they were like, we already have it. And I thought, if you already have it, why don't you tell me about it? So I went forward at the altar call and I was like, I want this. I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I remember praying and praying and praying and praying and waiting and waiting and waiting and I just couldn't get there. And then finally, um, they said kind of like, well, you're the last guy. If you want to just hang out here, that's fine. I, I said, I'm not leaving. And I got to a point where I was like, I'm not leaving till I get this, Lord. I'm not. And I can remember when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I started speaking tongues. I ran out of the chapel and, and told everyone like, I got it, I got it, I got it. And in that moment, I just knew that uh, this was available for me. And I tell people, man, sometimes you have to tarry, sometimes you have to wait, sometimes you have to fight, sometimes you have to be hungry. Uh, God wants to give this to us. I, I just believe that so strong. I was, I was in my mind thinking, have I done anything wrong? Have I, hey, what's blocking this? And then I realized nothing was blocking this except for I needed to be ready to receive it. I, need, I didn't do anything wrong. This is a gift God wants to give his children. And so once I got to that spot where he wants to give me this, don't let the enemy tell me that I've done, uh, that I'm not good enough for this. If I'm his child, I'm good enough for this and I need this. And I, I would just tell people, go for it. Because for me, it was that moment of realizing, I'm going for it. I, I, this is what he wants to give me. I want to receive it and I want to live in it. And now, man, you can't stop me. I, I thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, of the Holy Spirit. I, we, I see Him in operation every day, and I can't imagine living a life that wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. I attended a little Pentecostal church all my life, and I had heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I always wondered, how, how can that be? How does it happen? How does God do it? So uh, I always, in a way, searched for the baptism and, uh, and waited on God. But I'll never forget the day in a little church in Las Cruces, New Mexico, on a Sunday night, that I stayed at the altar after the service was over, after everybody went home. I stayed at the altar and continued to pray and praise God and just exalt His name. And the more I praised the Lord, the more uh, I felt that something was taking place in my body. Uh, after a while, I noticed that as I praised the Lord, 
my tongue began to feel funny, my mouth, and I, and I said, you know, something is going on. And sure enough, after a while, I was praising God in another tongue, a tongue that I had never learned, a tongue that I had never experienced. And sure enough, it was a baptism in the Holy Spirit, and it was powerful. I tell you, to this day, I've never, never been the same. I can tell you with all of my heart that God does baptize with the Holy Spirit. So uh, I'm encouraging you to seek the baptism because something happens to you. You're just changed and transformed. You'll be able to preach and speak and teach uh, in, in a greater dimension. You'll be able to praise God in a wonderful new way that you've never, never praised Him before. I tell you what, when the Spirit of the Lord moves in your life, you start hearing things from God. You start seeing things from the Lord. You start experiencing God in a new way. You can tell others what God is doing in your life, that they can also wait for that moment when God will fill them with His Holy Spirit. I'm just encouraging everyone today to be open to the baptism because you will experience the mighty work of God in a way you never, never experienced before. I'm an introvert, so when it came to thinking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, I, I was scared to death of going down front and people laying their hands on me and, and all that. I, I was just, the thought of that almost made me break out in hives. It was a Sunday night at the end of service and the pastor called people forward to the altar if they wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And with, with some hesitation, I went down and sure enough, I was surrounded by people and they were praying loudly and, and I was shutting down. I wasn't thinking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about getting out of there. And one, one old lady, the church grandma, came down. She knew me and she recognized what was going on. And she just shooed all those people away. And she knelt down next to me and she said, Rodney, uh, are you ready to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I said, I am. And very quietly, no sensationalism. I didn't shout, I didn't dance, I didn't jump. She prayed with me and I began to pray in my prayer language. I'm so thankful for a church grandma that knew it didn't always have to happen with big emotion and big excitement, but the Holy Spirit would work within the confines of my personality and, and gloriously fill me. Praise the Lord, how thankful we are that it's not, it's not held to just one area or one amount of time, place of time, but it's been for generations since God poured out His Spirit and still today He desires, as it says in Joel, the second chapter, and Peter quoted there in Acts, the second chapter, that God wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. But once we are filled, this promise to make us witnesses, are there... Are there testimonies that can help us understand how it worked out in the lives of people? Well, the people who just shared their testimonies of how they were filled with the Holy Spirit will now share the testimonies of how they, the Holy Spirit worked through them. And so I do believe you're going to be touched even now as you listen to the practical ways, whether it's in witnessing, whether it's in healing, whether it's in just living your life for Jesus. Let's listen now into these testimonies to know that Jesus wants to move through His Spirit in our lives today. Let's go there now. My new grandbaby, granddaughter, Evie, had just been born and we were, it was Saturday night and she was three days old and I went over to see her and uh, her mom and dad. Her mom and dad don't matter as much. I mean, the grandbaby's what matters. And uh, on the way home, Driving from Tyler's house to my house, I had a sudden picture of my son as a single dad with his wife gone. And it, it just, it captured me so hard, I just began to, to pray. I'm old school, I was pleading the blood and just praying protection for my son and for his wife and for their daughter. The, the next morning, about seven o'clock, I got a call from my son and they were rushing my daughter-in-law to the hospital. When she got there, the it, it looked bad, the prognosis wasn't good, and uh, her blood pressure was super high, and her pulse rate was 157, and her pulse ox was super low. Uh, and as she, as she hung on to life, 
I thought back to the night before and that the Spirit had prompted me to pray. Then that afternoon, a pastor friend in town, Hugh and Katie Yarborough, Katie messaged me and she said, Pastor Ida, I heard what's going on with Emily. And I gotta tell you, I've, I know you and I know your wife, Cindy. I know Tyler, I've never met his wife. But last night I couldn't sleep because the Holy Spirit was just tugging at my heart to intercede and to pray for Emily. And I want you to know I stayed up last night praying for her. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to Katie. Because the Holy Spirit knew what was going to happen and called us to prayer. 57 hours after she entered the CICU, Emily walked out of that hospital healed and whole and she's healthy today. And I'm so thankful for people who pray. The Apostle Paul chided the Galatians when he was encouraging them to think in terms of finishing their work by the power of the Spirit. That's what they started in. He wanted them to finish in the power of the Spirit. I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit wants to do today what He has done for the last 2,000 years and by the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, release great miracles. Our council in 2003 was finishing. We had our ordination service and it had just come to a conclusion and I was exhorting the different ones that were being ordained and had just been ordained and when I came to this one particular young couple this young pastor I felt the Spirit of God speak to me that they were going to have a child by this time next year uh, doctors had told her that she would never be able to conceive and not be able to have children but the Spirit of God rose up in a prophetic anointing and I said this time next year you will be holding a new baby well, that was in April, on March the 5th of 2004. Uh, their first of two children were born. And it was so exciting to be a part of seeing the Holy Spirit move and then respond in faith and hold that baby at the next council meeting. My husband and I have the opportunity to minister to women and children who have been sold into prostitution and to be part of that rescue and restoration. One Sunday morning, it was Mother's Day, and I was in a church in Spain where some of these young women, teenagers, were in the morning service. And at the end of the service, we went to the front and invited women, men, in the service to come for prayer. And suddenly a young woman stood in front of me, an African young woman, with tears running down her face and she was asking for prayer. I took her in my arms and I said, my daughters are not here today, but you'll be my daughter this morning. Can I pray for you? And as I began to pray, I felt led of the Spirit to pray a specific kind of prayer. I began to pray over her. The tears just started coming down and her whole face changed. It wasn't until the end of the service that I discovered that this young woman who had been trafficked, trafficked from prostitution, for prostitution, from an early age, and now was 18, after 10 years of slavery, in this place where she was being restored, no one knew her name. But that morning as I had prayed over her, the Spirit had given me words. And I had prayed over her using her name repeatedly, telling her that God loved her. At the end, she said, for the first time, I know there's a God. He loves me and he knows my name. Thank you. If it wasn't for being able to rely on the anointing and guidance of the Holy Spirit, we could not begin to minister to those in sexual slavery. We totally depend on the work of the Spirit. I remember that I had applied for a job in a hospital and uh, they sent me to a battery of tests and uh, one of them was a physical test. And a report came back not too encouraging. I discovered that I had diabetes and that it was pretty serious at the time. So they wanted me to go on a special diet and pills and uh, possibly injections. Of course, it scared me because I'd never experienced that before. And uh, uh, 
I walked out of that hospital, you know, pretty sad, and I walked to the parking lot and sat in my car, and I said, Lord, what is this? You called me to study, to go into the ministry, Lord God. If I'm going to be preaching about healing, I can't be sick, Lord. You, you need to do something in my body. About a year later, I took the test again, the battery of tests, and uh, I discovered that uh, something had changed. The doctor came to me and he said, uh, who told you that you had diabetes? I says, well, I went to the community hospital and they told me that I had diabetes. They wanted me to go on a special diet and pills and everything else. And uh, they said it was pretty serious. So uh, he says, well, I have good news for you. You have no diabetes. I says, what? He says, no, you have no diabetes. Your body doesn't show that you had diabetes at any time. As a matter of fact, you don't have enough sugar in your system. <laughs> So uh, I, I really look back to that moment in my life and I see the power of the Holy Spirit working in my body, how He touched me, how He just made a miracle happen in my body so that I can preach that God does heal. Jesus is a healer today. So if you're going through something today, you can rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to touch your body, cause a miracle to happen in your body, and you'll have your testimony to give honor and glory and praise to Jesus. So today, I'm just encouraging you, believe and He will heal you. I had a dear friend, his name is Albert, and Albert had gotten hooked on drugs, but he heard about how God had changed my life and he came to see me one day. And he was high, he was hooked on heroin. And he came to see me and we talked and I prayed for Albert and he left. A few days later, a few weeks later, I saw him and he was high again and I said, Albert, tell me what happened after we prayed. And he said, I'm gonna tell you something. I have quit drugs before, but I've always had issues and my stomach problems and it's the issues that you go through when you quit using heroin. He said, but when you prayed for me for three days, I never had any, it was like I was brand new. He said, but then I made a choice to go back. And I realized probably for the first time in my life that I personally had experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit as I prayed over my friend Albert. And since that time, I've had the incredible privilege for a whole lot of people, that God would deliver them, that God would free them, that God would mend broken relationships, that God would restore relationships that have been broken as a result of their actions or the actions of others against them. The Holy Spirit, He's real. I just want to encourage you to believe for more. I can tell you this, sometimes we think God wants to do it for other people, but God wants to do it for everyone. And I want you to have your faith rise up. My own son was healed of autism. Now I know people say that can't happen, but my son was in special ed for two years. He would line everything up like a train. He couldn't make eye contact. And one day after church with just a simple prayer, we laid hands on him and prayed for him. A prophecy was given that God would heal our son for his glory. Our son started to look up at us. He no longer made the train. We brought him to special ed. The teacher said, what happened to Connor? I'm telling you, we told her that he was healed. She brought him the supervisor. They could not believe what God had done. I want you to believe for more. I was in a position where I saw God as a loving God. I saw him as a kind God, but I didn't believe for more. And that day changed me forever. I believe God for more. I believe that God wants to do the miraculous. I believe he wants to heal. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can lean into this. There's no shortage of supply, and I'm saying believe for more. Well, all those talks, those testimonies, those teachings have been good for me. I hope they've been good for you. Now, finally, we've come to this place where I want us to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here's how I'd like to do it. I'd like to just close this time and pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you, whether you're an individual watching this, uh, maybe it's Sunday evening you're watching it. Maybe it's later in the week that the video is just up on Facebook and you're watching it. But regardless, I'm praying that you would take time right now. There's no better time than now to get down on your knees and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Many of you have been filled before, but you know, it's funny. We can almost put it on as a badge and say, I've got it. I don't need it anymore. No, we need, it. We need to be filled with His Spirit every day. 
And so I'm going to ask you as an individual or as a family to take this time. And here's, here's how I'd like you to set it up. Get rid of the distractions. Man, don't have the TV on after this is over. Don't switch it over to some network TV or something. Turn that off. You might want to put on some instrumental music. Don't even put on music that has words because then your mind will drift to those words. You might want to put on some quiet instrumental music. And then let's just, let's set a time here. Let's say for the next 15 minutes, you just gather, whether it's yourself or your family or whoever's in the room, and you just seek out the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And then whoever is, whoever is kind of the head of the family or the head of that room right now, I'm going to ask you to be assigned at the end of that 15 minutes just to have a closing prayer and to kind of finish it up. But please, take time now so that we can say that at the end of this video, all across Union County and Essex County and Morris County and Middlesex County and maybe beyond, there were, there were people seeking the face of God to have Acts the first chapter, Acts the second chapter be reality in their lives. What the promise of the Father was is the promise fulfilled in them. Let me pray for you, let you go, and you go to prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we've had on this Pentecost Sunday. I thank you for the encouragement to move towards being filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord Jesus, that any hindrances right now would be set aside. Lord, I just pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted up. I pray hearts would be yielded to you and that Jesus, in that unique way that you desire to fill each different one, as they're filled, they will speak with other tongues but Lord, you work with individuals in, in, in who they are. Help them, Lord. Bless them. Be with them. And God, I know there'll be great testimonies. We've heard some already. Lord, we're going to hear more tonight. We thank you, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. So once again, let me say this. Go to prayer at the end of 15 minutes-ish, that time. Then have somebody close the entire time in prayer so you know when it's, when it's kind of done. But pray. Uh, one more little hint, I guess I should have said earlier. When you're praying, just don't close your mouth and say, I'm, but just quietly worship God. Move your lips, and again, uh, I can't give you an exact formula. There shouldn't be an exact formula. But just as God speaks to you, and just you, you just feel like you need to say, say it. And, and just let the Holy Spirit fill you to overflowing and speak with other tongues. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. God bless you. To everyone at Calvary Assembly and beyond, may this be a great week of Pentecost for you. Amen.